been at the pinnacle before as the most valuable player of the 1973 World Series in Oakland's defeat of the Mets. But could he ever top his final game performance in the 1977 World Series? It isn't likely. For by 10.25 p.m. on October 18, 1977, Reginald Martinez Jackson had set five World Series records and tied three others. If the true measure of a player is his performance in the big games, then how does Reggie Jackson measure up? He played in five World Series. That's a feat in itself. In 98 World Series at bats, he hit 10 homers and batted 357. Not bad for a career 260 hitter. His heroics in the Fall Classic earned him the nickname Mr. October, the ultimate compliment to his reliability in the clutch. <laughs> The first series between the Yankees and the Dodgers since 1963 began for the outgoing Tom Lasorda and fiery Billy Martin in refurbished Yankee Stadium. It would be the first series for the exuberant Lasorda, but for Martin, after a season of trials, then triumphs, a series win could mean final vindication for both the Yankees and their beleaguered manager. Commissioner Kuhn joins the capacity crowd in applause as the first ball is thrown out by Whitey Ford, a Yankee legend in his own right. The opening game had two winning World Series veterans facing each other. The Dodgers' Don Sutton against the Yankees' Don Gullett. Los Angeles jumped on the ex-Cincinnati left-hander for two quick first-inning runs. It was a game of might-have-beens and tantalizing if-only. For instance, if only Steve Garvey and Reggie Smith had not misfired on a hit-and-run play with no outs, the Dodgers might have run up a formidable lead in the very first inning. Or if only Steve Garvey had not hesitated between first and second on Glenn Burke's hit in the sixth, he might not have been out on a controversial play at home, and the Dodgers could have won game one in regulation time. Some speculated that umpire Nestor Shylock was too far up the first base line to make the definitive call. In any event, it was close. Very close. Conversely, with Manny Mota pinch hitting for Glenn Burke in the ninth, the Dodgers get caught once again on an unsuccessful hit and run play. Now, if only Yankee first baseman Chris Shambliss had not just barely missed a caught off first Dusty Baker, the Dodgers might never have deadlocked the game three all and sent it into extra innings. Then if only Lee Lacey, pinch hitting in the ninth against the otherwise first rate Sparky Lyle, had not smashed the ace reliever's first pitch to send Baker home with a tying run, the Yankees would have won it in regulation time instead of going into extra innings all tied at three each. Now, if only the Yankees had been able to sacrifice runners in the scoring position in either the 10th or 11th inning, the game might never have reached the 12th. But Jerry Grody gunned down both potential go-ahead runners impressively. Then came the final irony of all. Paul Blair came up with two on and no outs in the bottom of the 12th. If only Blair, normally an adept bunner, had not failed twice to advance the runners, he never would have had the chance to be the man of the hour. The hero whose sharp single passed the shortstop would drive in Randolph to win the first game for the Yankees, four to three. If Paul Blair was the final hero in this bizarre first game, other Warriors are foremost in the fans' thoughts as the Yankees and Dodgers prepare for game two.
Both teams will start pitchers who rely on pinpoint control. One of them has suffered through a year of frustration and chronic injury. The fact is that Jim Catfish Hunter has not pitched in more than a month. Ron Say drives in two with a moonshot in the first. Then in the second, again with two out, Steve Yeager digs in. Another high slider disappears to the great beyond in the left field seat. Guess who's just crazy about it? Mrs. Steve Yeager. With one on, one out in the third, a 31-year-old North Carolina farmer knows he must keep the ball down to this man. As one of four Dodgers with 30 or more home runs, Reggie Smith can zing you. Low and outside, just where Catfish wanted it. So when Smith turns his best pitch into a 400-foot home run, it's time to acknowledge that the former Cy Young winner has had it for the night. But a rusty subpar performance cannot diminish the class of a great competitor, and these fans show they recognize class when they see it. Where Catfish Hunter failed, Bert Hooten succeeded by serving up a recipe that had the Yankee hitters lunging at his assortment of fastballs mixed with bewildering knuckle curves. He struck out eight for a 6-1 Dodger win. Umpire Ed Sudol found Hooten's menu gave some Yankees acute indigestion. Randolph pleads with Sudol to confirm for the first base umpire that Willie had, in fact, struck out. Listen here. He went far enough for me. Don't you be intimidating. I'm not intimidating you. Don't, don't you be intimidating. I'm not intimidating you, but let me tell you something. As far as I'm concerned, he went enough. Well, that's good enough for me, because, okay. but sometimes get some help on it, too, all right? All right, buddy. That's the rule. All right. Speaking of intimidation, no one who saw the first two games of this series could ever say that baseball is a non-contact sport. For instance, Steve Yeager's rainbow homer in the third produced this valiant effort by Lou Pinella before he falls in a heap after his confrontation with an unyielding left field wall. Oh, you son of a... And this goes with Ed Sudol's profession. Oh, baby. You get me? Right. Where are we at? Get it, get it under there. Okay. I'm going to come at you. That's about a thousand times this year. Is that right? Yeah. They take bets, Coca-Colas, and seven up that I'll get hit three or four times a game. And don't take bets that this won't happen to Steve Yeager more often than he cares to remember. But he gets you, Yang. Oh, okay, keep your head up, Yang. Okay, okay. Okay, let's go. Oh, it hurt for a little while. Gritty guys like Steve Yeager may never grin about it. The wild horses couldn't get him out of there. Sure? Sure? Oh, let's go. We're down to full squad now. We won't come out now. With the series deadlock, the scene shifts to an L.A. temple. In L.A., the series is a happening for just plain folks and some others that everyone knows. Jackson said that Mickey Rivers makes us go. He hadn't up to now, and in Tommy John, the Dodgers had one of the great comeback players in sports. It didn't seem to worry Rivers. <laughs> then very little does. 
Mick the quick whips a curtain-raising double to right before the record Dodger crowd has even fully settled in. Jackson comes up with one out and a man in scoring position, thanks to an opposite field double by Thurman Munson that had already driven Rivers home with the game's first run. Reggie slices a hit, scoring Munson, and when Baker overruns the ball for the first error of the series, Jackson makes it easily to second. Here on enemy turf, a group of Yankee wives hope it's only the beginning. Sweet Lou Pinella obliges, and the Yankees lead 3-0 before the Dodgers can get to bat. The Yankees' Mike Torres squirms out of the first two innings. But in the third, Reggie Smith's on first with the dangerous Steve Garvey at the plate. Decapitation. Almost, anyway as Garvey lines a blistering single to center to put runners on both first and third with two out. And Torres squirms some more as he coaxes the count to three and two on another potential Dodger howitzer, Dusty Baker. three up and the love in that is the 1977 Dodgers takes full flight now with a game tied Tommy John the Dodgers stopper all season has his chance Becomes a scratch single. A high bouncer puts a man on third. Another good pitch is bounced to second for a run. Sometimes it's better to be lucky than good. The count goes to one and one on Chamblin. Chris nudges it through the hole. Jackson scores. And without a really well-hit ball in two innings, the Yankees score twice, and it's five to three. Ninth inning, reliever Charlie Huff pitches to Paul Blair. Watch Ron Say. Agonizing for Paul Blair. Accolades for Ron Say. A now confident Mike Torres has 10 outs in a row and eight strikeouts as he faces Davey Lopes with two out in the last of the night. <laughs> Lopes becomes the ninth strikeout victim. And Mike Torres, so instrumental in the Yankees' late season drive, wins another key game, five to three. And the Yankees go ahead in the series two games to one. Typical Los Angeles Bluebird weather as the contenders prepare for game four. The president's mother, Lillian Carter, an enthusiastic baseball fan with a soft spot for the Dodgers, throws out the first ball and basks in that California warmth. Chris Shambliss on second. Lou Pinella on third. Rick Roden replaces Doug Rao with no outs in the second and one run in. With the infield deep, Nettles grounds to second, and Pinellas scrambles home. The Yanks are up to their old tricks. With the infield in, Dent taps one through, and the third run scores. With two out in the bottom of the third, the Yankees' Ron Guidry has set down eight straight. You might expect pitcher Rick Roden would be the ninth. Surprise! 
A well hit ball past Pinella becomes a ground rule double, and Dodger fans get an unexpected lift as Roden ambles in the second. Dodger second baseman Davey Lopes is 0 for 12 at this point. Now he's 1 for 13. Hopes become deeds, and the Dodgers take heart when their powerful little captain pulls them within a run with six innings yet to go. Bottom of the fourth. And the Yankee left-hander faces the Penguin, the power-hitting Ron Say. Say claps one deep to left field. But the Yankees' Pinella flexed the ball right out of home run territory to save Guidry's 3-2 lead. It's only when you see this gem slowed down that it fully sparkles, where Pinella makes the fantastic look easy when he nonchalants it. Like Torres the day before, Ron Guidry gets tougher as the game goes on. He gives up with four hits, strikes out seven before it's over. And game four is a harbinger of things to come. But with only two singles in games one, two, and three, Reggie Jackson begins to strut his stuff with two runs scored, a double, and this, his first series home run in the sixth that closes out the scoring for both teams. Furthermore, for the first time, Jackson becomes an important factor in a Yankee win. A victory that puts New York ahead three games to one, and for hometown fans, close to ending it all right here in Dodger Stadium. Incidentally, one of baseball's charms is in its telltale personality traits. For instance, Thurman Munson never bats before going through this ritual with his hitting glove. Then there's the Steve Garvey one-step. The Tidrow hat pull. Mickey Rivers' bat trick. The Nettles' glove trick. The Lopes' set. And of course, all kinds of huffs and puffs. There's the Lasorda again. No two teams, no two players are ever quite the same in baseball's passing parade. Game five offers the Yankees the unexpected chance to close out the series in Dodger country. But not if Don Sutton, who has never pitched badly in World Series competition, can prevent it. He'll lock horns once again with the Yankees' Don Gullett. Steve Garvey on second in the fourth with a double, and the Dodgers leading one to nothing. Dusty Baker slams the ball to left, and Garvey scores while Pinella's error, the first for the Yankees in the series, allows Baker to hustle in the second. Gullet induces Lee Lacey to hit the ball to Nettles, who boots it after making several stunning plays earlier. And everybody's safe. When Steve Yeager tidily parks a high gullet fork ball into the left field corner, the route is on. This is the kind of command these fans have come to expect of their Dodgers. And oh, how they did savor it, both in the stands and on the field. And when Reggie Smith bruised Dick Tidrow in the sixth with a two-run blast, he put the final icing on what has become a daytime nightmare for the Yankees. 
but more never seemed to be enough for these Dodger Blue loyalists. Not even 10 to nothing. Don Sutton surrenders two Yankee runs in the seventh, plus a two-out homer to Munson in the eighth. Determined to walk no one, Sutton serves up another fat pitch to Jackson, who jumps all over it for a vicious clout high off the foul pole screen and right. But hidden within the recesses of the Yankee debacle is another two-for-four performance by Reggie Jackson. What is even more significant, Jackson is now getting around in the ball after being late on pitches throughout the series. But who could ever imagine what all this portended? Sutton settles down in the ninth to retire the last three men in order for a 10-4 complete game victory. Now for all the Dodgers and the manager who insists he bleeds Dodger blue, redemption was over 3,000 miles away. Where the elegant Joe DiMaggio still enchants crowds and commands the respect of players as well as generations of baseball fans. A hero of game three, Mike Torres paws his turf as he contemplates his first inning problem. Ron Say on first, Reggie Smith at second, with the always tough Steve Garvey measuring his chances with two outs. Steve goes with the pitch. Both runners score, and Garvey beats the relay into third easily to the delight of these Dodger wives. Just as they did in games one and two, the Dodgers jump ahead two to nothing. Bert Hooten, who had collared Reggie Jackson impressively in game two, walked him on four straight pitches to open the Yankees second. It didn't seem all that significant right then, since Chambliss had not solved Hooten either. But this time he did. Not only check, but checkmate. And so the Yankee long ball hitting that had stirred itself in the burnt ashes of game five awakes early to tie game six at two all. The contrast in moods tells the story. With only three days rest, and having thrown over 130 pitches in winning game three, could Torres hang on? Reggie Smith seemingly gave the answer with a monster shot deep into the center field bleacher. It's Smith's third series homer, and the ninth for the Dodgers against Yankee pitchers. Yankee catcher Thurman Munson leads off the bottom of the third. Munson smacks the pitch sharply for a long single to keep his streak alive for the hit in 10 straight series games. As Hooten tries to calm himself with a critical task ahead, some 56,000 fans here and over 65 million television viewers know that Hooten can't afford to walk Reggie Jackson again. One swing, and Jackson hits it on the line into the right field stand. The Yankees seesaw back into a 4-3 to three lead. The fact that he'd homered in his last two swings in the eighth inning of Game 5 and here in Game 6 was at this point little more than a curiosity. Tom Lasorda was ready for a change. But he wanted to give his bullpen more time. Get you out of here, Happy. All right. We'll get you out of here. Hello, Tom. Hi, John. How are you? Doing, what would you do in this situation if you were well, managing this ball club, John? You, did, you took this club in first, man. I, know, I, know. I got a big decision to make, and I just don't know what to do. I Take thought maybe time. possibly I'm could help me. John, yeah. I got a decision to make, and I just don't want to make time, huh? Whatever you think will be best, John, I'll go along with it, because I know you're very knowledgeable. Very knowledgeable. Very knowledgeable. It might not have been enough time, but the Yankees pick up another run, and it's 5-3 to three in the fifth. Randolph on first, Elias Sosa pitching. With two swings, 
Jackson has two home runs. Now the crowd's mood shifts, and so does this man as he ponders what elixir he needs to get Reggie Jackson out. One of the game's most enigmatic free spirits stands on the threshold of baseball immortality. Tenacious Mike Torres, just as he had in game three, responds to good fortune and retires 10 in a row through the seventh inning. But in the eighth, all thoughts are with this bundle of contradictions. Both the man and his potential for the incredible has everyone in its grip. What could Tom Lasorda be thinking? And what could be in reliever Charlie Huff's head? They all await the final chapter for this self-proclaimed Mr. October. Jackson stamps his name forever into the pages of World Series history. The bottom line, most homers, five. First man to hit three homers in a row in one series game. Most runs, 10. Most total bases, 25. Magic time. The greatest single performance I have ever seen, said Tom Lasorda. These Yankee fans just won't quit. They demand a curtain call. There's no quit in the Dodgers, though. They scratch for a run in the ninth off a of now-tired Mike Torres. But when Torres squeezes Lee Lacey's pop-up, it's all over. Reggie put his indelible stamp on the 77 series. No one who watched can forget his final game performance, when each home run traveled farther than the one before. The late Dick Hauser once said that he never thought a player could turn it on when he wanted until he saw Reggie Jackson. What Jackson accomplished in 1977 linked him with the greats from the distant past. Jackson said I was lucky. Babe Ruth was great. But no one could deny, with his achievement in the 77 World Series, Reginald Martinez Jackson joined baseball's elite. <laughs>